Now, we'll just begin first by, uh, since it is Pascha season, let's just sing to uh, the risen Christ. Christ is risen from the dead. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling on death by death. And the Lord lives in sweet, 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 Christ is risen from the dead, trampling on death by death. And the Lord lives in sweet, sweet, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling on death by death. I'd like to speak tonight on a subject which is very relevant to our times, the end of the world. More particularly, it's the signs which are being fulfilled in our times, which point to the end of the world. <clears throat> there have been a number of times in the past when this subject has become very interesting. In fact, you can call them apocalyptic times. The apostles themselves felt this, that their times were very apocalyptic. I'll read a little later on some of the statements they make in the scriptures which show that they really expected the end of all things to be very close. <clears throat> At various other times, for example, in the West, around the year 1000, there was great expectation of the end. In Russia, around the 15th century, again, there was a period when the end was expected shortly. And many people in our own times have the same feeling that time is running out, that something big is going to happen. And often this is bound up with the, the number 2000. It is, we've come to the end of two millenniums of Christianity, and the millennium itself is a big thing, a whole thousand years, and two of them mean some great, either great crisis must be approaching, and many people place this in terms of end of the world. And of course, it does not necessarily mean anything since we don't know the, the day or the hour or the year when the world is going to end. But I'll try to I'll go into the points of how, I, what our attitude should be towards this expectation of the end. Nowadays, when you think about apocalyptic awareness, you think of uh, Protestant sectarians of various kinds who have definite ideas about what's going to happen at the end of this age. But it's not only religious thinkers, it's also it's ordinary secular philosophers who talk about the end of the world in a very bold way. <clears throat> to take one example, I'll give one who is a, should be close to us because he's an Orthodox writer, probably known to everyone here, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who has been outside of Russia since 1974 and has written about life in the Soviet Union, and especially in the Soviet slave labor camps, the famous Gulag. He's not what one consider a mystical thinker, or a vague thinker, or someone who's up in the clouds. He's very down to earth. About two, almost three years ago now, he gave a talk at the Harvard commencement, in which he told the people of the West, just as before that he spoke to the Soviet leaders, just as boldly, and told them that their civilization was collapsing and was in danger of being taken over by communism that modern humanism is not deep enough to satisfy the human soul, is no model that can be followed by Russia, if Russia should overthrow communism. And at the end of this address, <clears throat> he used the following words to express his idea of the depth of the crisis which is now going on in the world. He says, if the world has not come to its end, it has approached a major turn in history, equal in importance to the turn from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Here he speaks seriously of the possibility of the end of the world, based on his observations that it is impossible for men to live long without deep spiritual roots. And these spiritual roots have been uprooted in the East by communism, in the West by worldly humanism. <clears throat> in his other writings, Solzhenitsyn, like many realistic thinkers today, speaks of specific reasons, quite apart from spiritual ones, why he thinks that such a great crisis period is facing humanity. And he mentions those things which you will find in any kind of a news magazine or any kind of a serious analysis of today's news. Namely such things as the nearness of the exhaustion of the Earth's resources, if they're used at the present rates, 
the disastrous pollution of air and water, which is much worse in Russia than in America, the over overpopulation of the world, and the approaching disastrous shortage of food, which seems coming, and of course the development of weapons in the last few decades, which makes the virtual annihilation of life, of human life, possible. All this relates to the physical signs of an approaching great crisis, <clears throat> the end of the modern age, perhaps the end of the world itself. But much more remarkable than these are the spiritual signs that are multiplying in our times. And this is what I'd like to talk mostly about tonight. First of all, I'd like to ask a question. What should be the attitude of a committed Christian, an Orthodox Christian, towards this whole idea of the end of the world? <clears throat> and towards the signs which are preparing for it. Should we dismiss all this as some kind of superstition, hysteria, and so forth? No, we should not. We have, for, first of all, the answer by, given by our Lord Jesus Christ himself in the Gospel. Just two days before he was to go to his Passion, his disciples came to him on the Mount of Olives and asked him, Tell us when shall all these things be? That is, the destruction of the temple which he had just mentioned. And then they asked him, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And our Savior at that moment did not reject the question, but as he did other times, and the disciples asked things which they should not be asking, as when James and John were asking who would be, would they be able to sit next to him in the kingdom of heaven? On the contrary, he allowed them to ask the questions, and he answered. And this answer takes up the whole the 24th chapter of the book of St. Matthew, where the historical events before the end of the world are set forth, and the 25th chapter, where he teaches more fully on the coming judgment and on how to prepare for his coming. <clears throat> in a shorter form, there's also a in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. Some of these prophecies refer directly to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Several which happened several decades after the crucifixion, but the rest refers to the end of the whole world. In his answer, our Lord gives the following main points. First of all, beware of deception, of following false Christ. That's in verses 4 and 5. Then there were various signs, such as wars, famines, earthquakes, and all these are not the end, it's just the beginning of the tribulation. Then there will be the moral signs, the persecutions of Christians, increase of evil, the growing cold of love, which is one of the main signs that Christianity is, is dying, because the sign of a Christian, as the Lord told us, is that they have, they have love for others. Then another sign is the gospel is to be preached to the whole world, and then the end will come after that. Another sign that there will be a terrible tribulation, that is, apart even from all the things he mentions already, the wars, famines, earthquakes, and the abomination of desolation will be in the holy place, which you're supposed to understand according to the interpretation handed down by the Holy Fathers, which I'll speak about. <coughs> and the fact that the days will be shortened for the sake of the elect. Then again he warns about false Christs and false prophets, and about great signs and wonders which, if possible, would be destroy even the elect. It is not only terrible physical events are going to happen, but deceptions which are so subtle that even the elect themselves might be fooled by it. <clears throat> then, the sign of the coming of Christ, it will be sudden from above, and not like his first coming. And the, the signs of the very end, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and then... Christ himself will appear in the heaven with the sign of the cross. But he tells us that the day and hour of his coming is not for us to know. Nonetheless, we should pay attention. He gives us the parable of the fig tree so that when we know, when we see the figs becoming green, we know that summer is nigh. And therefore, when we watch the signs and see these things beginning to happen, then we know that the times are right, the end is coming near. Therefore, we are to watch not for a specific day or time, we're supposed to watch for the signs of the end so we can be prepared, and especially prepared against deception, which is involved with one of the great events to happen at the end of the world, the coming of Antichrist, which I'll mention in a moment. <clears throat> the answer to Christians, therefore, is to watch and be ready for that time. And the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew is taken up with several images, parables, about how we are to watch. 
that is, the five foolish and five wise virgins, those who have their wicks trimmed, that is, have obtained the grace of the Holy Spirit, who are practicing the Christian life, and are not just learning the faith and then not doing anything about it. Another one is the parable of the talents, and the other the parables of that 25th chapter of Matthew. <coughs> The age of the apostles, the first century, as I mentioned, was full of this expectation that Christ would soon return. The apostles, in fact, today it's a little difficult for us even to imagine how the apostles were so filled with fervor for Christ that they went out to all the ends of the universe. And they literally did. Apostle Thomas went to India, some say even as far as China. Andrew went north to Scythia, which is now Russia. Aristobulus and others went to England. Matthew and others went south to Abyssinia. And the whole sort of civilized world at that time was covered by the apostles. Because they had the idea that the world was coming soon to an end, they were to go out to all lands and preach the gospel. Already by the destruction, the, time of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD, the gospel had been preached to virtually all the known inhabited world. <clears throat> and from that time on began the bringing forth of fruits among all those countries which had the seed of the gospel planted in them. And we see so if you take any one particular country that received the gospel, you can see, tracing in its history, how over the centuries it brought forth fruits, it had saints, the uh, life of the people was totally changed, and there was a total difference between the time that that country was pagan and the time it accepted Orthodox Christianity. You can take any country in the West, Britain or France or in the East, Byzantium or Syria or uh, Russia. And the, the apostles mentioned some of the, the, some of the uh, passages where they mention the coming of the end are in St. Paul, Hebrews 10.37. He quotes the, uh, the prophet Habakkuk. Yet a very little while, and he that cometh shall come, and shall not tarry. And again in Philippians 4.5, Rejoice in the Lord always, the Lord is at hand. St. John mentions in 1 John 2.18, Little children, it is the last hour. And the end of the apocalypse Christ himself says, Yea, I come quickly. Amen. And then John says, Amen, come, Lord Jesus. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 7, The end of all things is at hand. And then when there were complaints about people who said that the end was a long time in coming, he told about his famous statement that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a single day. And he's only being patient with us until we repent. <clears throat> it's in Second Peter 3, 4 to 10. And then after that, in that same passage, he gives the uh, fullest description we have of the actual end of the world by fire. <clears throat> so from that very time, those who were fervent Christians had a definite idea the world is soon coming to an end. Of course, it's been since that time, 1900 years, does that mean the apostles are mistaken? Or anybody else since then who thinks this idea is simply mistaken and we should be uh, put away all ideas that the end of the world is at hand, that Christ is coming soon? No, it does not. It means we should understand this in the right way. And the right way is a spiritual way. If we are ourselves leading, conducting a conscious spiritual life, conducting the unseen warfare, against our own fallen nature and against the demons who are against us, we will be constantly expecting the coming of Christ into our soul. With our death, of course, we are to meet Christ. And anyone who has this kind of feeling in his soul, for him it is quite natural to expect the soon coming of Christ. The only danger is if you go overboard and begin to try to place dates, to calculate exactly when it's going to happen, to be too concerned about specific events which are occurring and too quick to place them in categories as if they fit into chapters of the Apocalypse, like this famous book that came out a few years ago, The Late Great Planet Earth. In, in 20 years it will be outmoded. And all the things he talked about, he has to go through and make a new book and fit them into some kind of new events. So it doesn't pay to go overboard on those details. Our approach has to be a little broader, a little higher, but just as firm. And, uh, of course, the big mistake made by people who go overboard on these details uh, occurs when they fall into the heresy of Kiliasm, the expectation of Christ coming to earth for a thousand years. This is a very troublesome heresy which was uh, 
widespread even in the early history of the church and was condemned at the Fifth Ecumenical Council. No, even earlier. It was condemned at the Second Ecumenical Council and that's when the phrase was put in the creed. And, and the kingdom of Christ will have no end. Because the idea was that the kingdom, of, since it says in the Apocalypse, chapter, what is it, chapter 12, I believe, that the devil was bound for a thousand years and Christ came and reigned with his saints. If you just read the text straight through without stopping and interpreting it, especially reading what the Holy Fathers have said about it, you get the idea that there's some kind of a thousand period, a thousand a period of a thousand years, somewhere between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And that means you have to have three different judgments. In fact, the Protestants do that. They have a great white throne judgment and some other kind of a judgment. And it, it sort of confuses the whole picture of uh, Christian eschatology. But in the universal interpretation of the Orthodox Holy Fathers, there's no mystery about it. The whole idea of the reign of Christ with his saints is occurring now. This is the Church. The life in the Church is such a blessed state because we are with Christ. We have his grace. We have his body and blood within us that this is like paradise. And this is what people call the millennium. And this thousand years means the whole period. A thousand is a round number. Ten times ten times ten in symbolical language means the fullness of time between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. If you expect a specific one thousand year period, then you're very anxious to, for this period to come and you begin multiplying all kinds of signs which you see. And the slightest little thing that happens, you begin to cry out, this is a sign of the end. And it may not be at all. Or it may be one of those signs which occur throughout the history, like the sign of there will be many antichrists. And St. John says, even from the time when he was living, there were already many antichrists. And therefore, that is not the sign that the world is right now approaching its last ten years. It means that this is one of the spiritual signs which is preparing for the end of the world. <clears throat> St. Paul himself, who was very filled with awareness of the coming end of the world and the coming of Christ, warns Christians even in his time not to be too excited about the end of the world says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 4, Be not quickly shaken in mind or troubled, as though the day of the Lord is just at hand. Let no one deceive you. That day will not come, except the falling away come first, and the man of lawlessness be revealed, the son of perdition. This is a very important sign of the end, the falling away or the apostasy, and the coming of the man of lawlessness, which is Antichrist. And this I'd like to spend quite a bit of our attention on. This concept of apostasy is a key one to understand the events of our own times. <clears throat> it's a very big topic to go into completely. But briefly, a student of history, looking at the whole past 2,000 years of especially Western history, can see a continuous thread of development. And in the last 900 or 1,000 years, you can see the various strands which go to make up our modern history and modern civilization. The civilization of today is shaped by the events and developments of yesterday. And when Solzhenitsyn speaks about the coming of a great world crisis, or even the end of the world, he's referring to the fact that this historical current, which has been going for the last thousand years at least, is now coming to its end. It, there's no place further for it to go. Either it must change drastically or destroy mankind. So Zenithin traces it back to the end of the Middle Ages. Actually, it goes back further. If you examine historically, I think you can see that it traces back just to the time when Rome fell away from the Church. That is, the year 1054, the mid-11th century, when something happened in the West, and the West chose to go its own way, being outside contact with the churches of the East. This breaking off from Rome was the... <coughs> Of, by on the part of Rome was the beginning of the, what can be called the mainstream of apostasy. Because apostasy means falling away, means a very small falling away. And although, if you look at Rome in the 12th century, it was they're still fairly close to orthodoxy. Nonetheless, it had begun to deviate in these various ideas about the importance of the Pope and so forth. <coughs> And once this, mo this movement of apostasy began, it went step by step, very logically, to produce the world which we see today. <clears throat> Rome broke off because the worldly ideas of church government, the papacy, became dominant. And once independent, 
these inno innovations began to enter into the life of Rome until it became, over the centuries, more and more different from Orthodox. <coughs> Worldliness in the Western world produced the pagan Renaissance and the departures in the Roman Church from the true Christian practices of the earlier Church, most notably the idea of the indulgences and especially the selling of them, produced the Protestant Reformation, which gradually threw out almost all of the ancient Christian tradition together with the various superstitions and false practices against which it was supposedly rebelling. <coughs> This, in turn, produced the reaction which we know as the Age of Enlightenment, the 18th century, which threw out religion altogether and tried to base life upon human reason and common sense, which is basically what civilization is trying to live on today. And this is what it produced, the communism, with which Solzhenitsyn came out of, and which she is protesting against, which is the last and most consistent form of trying to make life on Earth solely in fitting human ideas, and not divine. <clears throat> if Rome had not first fallen away from orthodoxy and started this whole process of apostasy, world history would have been much different. We can see even now that the Eastern countries like Greece and Russia, which were orthodox, did not have a Renaissance or Reformation or even an Enlightenment period, <clears throat> like the West did. And if they are now bound up with the same kind of worldview that the West is, it's because they have, in this last century or two, finally accepted all these ideas and been poisoned by them, and therefore become part of the whole world, which is now involved in one single civilization. That is, Western civilization, and it's, as Solzhenitsyn rightly sees, in its dying phase. In the same passage where St. Paul mentions the apostasy in Second Thessalonians, he gives a second name for this movement. He calls it the mystery of iniquity, or the mystery of lawlessness. He says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Preparing for Antichrist was the man of lawlessness. And if we look around at our 20th century civilization, the word lawlessness or anarchy is perhaps the chief characteristic that identifies it. A few examples. In modern art, by the beginning of the 20th century, all the various schools of modern art dissolved into what can only be called some kind of lawless states, that is, from cubism, futurism, ending in just blocks upon a, um, a canvas, or else, like Jackson Pollock was doing 25 years ago, simply standing in the midst of a canvas this big and getting inspired and dipping his, his, his paint brushes in that pails and simply whatever comes into his hands to throw on the canvas. And sometimes it's very pleasing, sort of nice shapes, but it's not art. It's not, you can't seriously call it art if the ancient masters are art, because they were meticulous and careful and they, there was a whole art, a science to it. And therefore you can say this is some kind of, compared to the ancient, even the more ancient modern art, this is some kind of lawlessness, because they're letting themselves go and do what is against all the laws. <coughs> And nowadays, of course, you can see masterpieces which are simply uh, candle soup cans painted. $20,000. <laughs> in modern music, the same way. In fact, there's a historian of modern music, Alfred Frankenstein, who said he wrote a complete history of Western music when he came to the 20th century. He stopped and said, I cannot write anymore because what comes from here on is no longer music, as I know it. And he, he appreciated there's something there, but he said it is not does not obey the laws music obeyed up until the end of the 19th century, they've heard something else, that somebody else write about it. Because, again, some kind of lawlessness, there's some kind of a new principle entered into life. <clears throat> this, sort of, once you get this far, really there's no place else to go. That's the end of that, that's why Solzhenitsyn has this feeling that something's coming to an end, because you cannot keep going down, you can't keep painting Campbell's soup cans, you call it art. Something else has to happen, there's no place else for it to go, there has to be either an explosion, totally something new principle has to enter in, like Christianity came in Roman times, and totally transformed art, made a whole new art. But if something new didn't happen, then the whole civilization sort of winds down, and that's the end of it. <clears throat> in the realm of moral teaching, it's quite noticeable, especially in the last 20 years or so, how 
lawlessness has become become the norm, became the, the norm. And even people in high positions in the clergy and um, liberal denominations usually of uh, Catholics, Protestants and so forth are sometimes quite willing to justify all kinds of things that before would have considered immoral. Now they're considered some kind of a new morality um, situation, ethics and so forth. So he needs to mention specifically in his Harvard talk what happened in New York City three years ago when the electricity was cut off. He said, the center of your culture is left without electric power for a few hours only. And all of a sudden, crowds of American citizens start looting and creating havoc. The smooth surface film must be very thin. Your social system must be quite unstable and unhealthy. And of course, that's, a, uh, that's one of those events which does show what is underneath. Because often, conventional behavior goes on as long as something extraordinary doesn't happen. And when some crisis happens, or just a simple thing that the lights go out. Forty years ago, the lights went out in America, nothing when people would help each other out and light candles and so forth. And now, instead, they go and break windows and loot, take everything they can get for themselves, kill people, and get away with whatever they can get away with. I mean, something has gone, has changed in this short period of time. All this is a sign of what St. Paul calls the mystery of lawlessness. And it's, it's a mystery because a mystery is something which is not fully revealed in this world. It is something which comes from the other world. And the mystery of righteousness is the whole story of how Christ came from heaven, how he came from heaven to be incarnate to save us. And the mystery of lawlessness is the opposite. It's some kind of a mystery coming up from hell, which breaks into this world and changes this world. And therefore, this is the mystery of lawlessness, or, or anarchy, which is preparing for the coming of the man of lawlessness, who is Antichrist. <clears throat> Even in politics and government, which make no sense at all, unless you have the idea of order, this idea of lawlessness is entering in. If you look at the, how the world is divided, half the, almost half the world now is in the communist camp. And communism is a, if you look at it objectively, is a very strange form of political economic order because it makes no sense as far as politics is concerned it's tyranny which they claim to be against as far as economics is concerned it does not work and the whole point of installing it is to make it work better than capitalism and therefore from the point of view of those who introduced communism into world governments it makes no sense because it does not accomplish what it means to accomplish and produces a slave status so she needs some rights about very elegantly and yet it takes over the world and the rest of the world seems to be falling into this or at least powerless to stop the movement of communism. <clears throat> what is the reason for that? Now I'll say a word about communism. It's not simply a system of politics or economics. Politically, it holds together only by terror. By that we lock. In fact, anyone who wants to understand what's happening in the world today should, must read Solzhenitsyn's book, the Gulag Archipelago, that tells exactly what life is like. In Russia for 60 years, other countries for 30 years or less, and coming to the rest of the world. And it's written very humanely. He doesn't have any bitterness about what happened. He has suffered through it himself and gives a very accurate description of what it's all about. Economically, it fails. Solzhenitsyn points out that the Tsar's government exported wheat and the Soviets have imported wheat. <coughs> The name is one of their failures. But how can people believe? If you, even if you do believe in this Marxist system, you have to admit that it's a very strange philosophy. It is not an ordinary philosophy that it's better to have the people vote or it's better to have one monarch over many people. It's not simple like that at all. It's like a, a dream world, like a fantasy world. It's exactly like the movements which were very common in the 16th century called the Anabaptist movements. When someone would proclaim himself to be Jesus Christ or the prophet of Jesus Christ, he would go out and people would begin to follow him. He would get a big uprising, there would be a peasant revolt, and finally the prince would come along and chop them all down and everything would be peaceful again. But in the meantime, he had gotten the whole country excited and people thought that some kind of great religious thing was happening. And communism has the same idea. That the, if you examine it, it's actually a kiliastic idea that paradise is coming to earth just ahead of us. Uh, the communist movement in the 19th century is very interesting to, to read about the beginning of this movement because 
the early prophets, like the one that Dostoevsky was reading, this Fourier in France, if you read his writings, it's actually fantastic nonsense. He talks about the coming age of world peace and prosperity when all the fountains are going to be overflowing with pink lemonade, and you're going to pick off the meat chops off of trees, all kinds of fantastic things. How can anybody take it seriously? And they did. This is what inspired, or even Marx was inspired at the beginning, with, until Marx finally became mature and saw that this is all fairy tales, but he's going to make it on a scientific basis. And therefore he developed what's called scientific materialism. And he then set forth the way how to bring this into reality by overthrowing the bourgeois governments. But when he comes into power, what is the, what is the answer? He promises actually the same thing that these people were promising. Because even Lenin, the foundation of Russian communism, his idea is First of all, there's the revolution. You change society, overthrow, kill all the kings and the middle class and so forth, take up all the possessions, give power to the workers. It's a very vague thing, the workers. The workers are the first ones to go to jail. But you give power to the people somehow, but actually only a few take it over for them, sort of holding it in the bank for them the time being, because they aren't able to take care of themselves. And after a certain number of years, this so-called dictatorship of the proletariat withers away. And then people become peaceful, happy, contented, and there's no more problems. And someone even asked them what's going to happen in case somebody has a religious idea or wants to go back to the old-fashioned ways of doing things. And he says, it's, they asked him, won't you need a police department at least? And he said, there will be no need for a police department because the people themselves will be so changed under the new conditions of society that when anybody has a non-social idea, he'll be automatically squashed like a bug by the people themselves. In other words, people will be so happy that they're squashing people to begin with, but that they will themselves do it. And there will be no need for police or armies or anything of the sort. So it's absolute fairy tales. And this is what communist ideology is based upon. It's a very strange uh, political philosophy. <clears throat> this means that it partakes in this, the same principle of lawlessness. And it's some kind of lawlessness which pretends to be orderly. And that means it's like a forerunner of the coming of Antichrist. <clears throat> The reason why communism takes over the world is not because it's so much smarter than capitalism or the democracies or anything of the sort. It's because in the West there is some kind of spiritual vacuum. And when this vacuum is present, communism marches, takes in one little territory after the other until its, its present has conquered nearly half the world. <clears throat> but communism does not have the final answer because it's a very negative thing. And in fact, if you see what's been happening in Russia in the last 10, 20 years, you can see that there's a full revolt as far as the people's mentality is against this whole system of communism. Although the dictatorship is just as strong as ever, in the last two years especially been putting more people in prison again, and the police is very strong and everywhere. Nonetheless, the people are more and more are rising up. That is not an armed revolt, but they're rising up in their, their minds and becoming independent, which means sooner or later the whole system is going to collapse. And so communism does not have the answer. It cannot sort of conquer the whole world and then bring peace and happiness like it claims it can. <clears throat> but in the meantime, it's preparing for one very important thing which has to happen before the end of the world can come. And that is that there has to be one unified world government which is from which Christianity has somehow been kicked out. And that communism has been doing very successfully. But in order to, to supply people with a spiritual basis, and a spiritual in quotation marks, for a one world government, there has to be something higher. And we see in the ideas, for example, of the United Nations, some kind of a thing that looks like a spiritual answer. It claims to be for the foundation of a one world government, which will be not a tyranny, not based upon any particular idea like communism, but very vague and no particular Christian basis. In fact, there's a meditation <coughs> chapel or something in the UN building, which is about 20 years ago, when they built they, they had a big discussion as to what would be the object of worship in this. You have a cross, you're immediately branded as Christian. You can't have anything Muslim or Hindu because you're already identified. It has to be above all religions. And you finally decided upon some kind of little block, like a blank block. It's like bowing down to an idol. You go there and bow down to it. But this means a very vague kind of a, of a religious interest. Of course, everybody has a religious interest. You can't hide that. Communism is, is going to fall because of that. But such a vague thing, it means 
that's exactly the kind of thing that the devil likes to grab a hold of. That is, any particular religious belief, you may be mistaken. At least you put your heart to it, and God can even forgive all kinds of mistakes. But if you don't have any particular religious belief, and you give yourself as some kind of vague idea, then the demons come in and they begin to, to act. <clears throat> Another sign of the, the times of the end, if they are approaching, is the present state of the Jews in Israel, in the city of Jerusalem. According to the prophecies of Scripture and the Holy Fathers of the Orthodox Church, Jerusalem will be the world capital of Antichrist. And there he will rebuild the Temple of Solomon, where he will be worshipped as God. Is that the events coming at the very end of the world. Of course, it's very significant that only since 1948 has Jerusalem been once more in the hands of the Jews. Only since 1967 has the place where the temple was, the Mosque of Omar, has it been in the hands of Jews because that was in the part which was held by the Muslims. And therefore, all that prevents them, that is, uh, technically, from building the temple is to destroy this Mosque of Omar and then use the site to build the temple. <clears throat> if you were to ask anyone was aware at all of political events in the world. Uh, question. What would be the ideal city to have as the world capital that is going to be a world empire? It's obvious what the answer would be in most people's minds. It can't be New York because it's the center of capital. It can't be Moscow because it's the center of communism. It can't even be Rome because Roman Catholicism is still some kind of limited religion. And the logical place is Jerusalem. Because there are three religions come together, three continents come together. It's the most logical place where there can be peace, brotherhood, and harmony, all those things which look good, but unless they have a solid Christian foundation, are not godly. Those things which can be used by Antichrist. Another aspect of this of the Jewish uh, question is that many young Jews are becoming interested in Christianity. Because among the Jews also there is the same kind of religious seeking and problems that occur among other people. And some of these are being converted to Christianity, some of them are coming to Orthodox. This is already a sign that sort of a preparation for the fact that at the end of time the Jews will be restored to Christianity, to Christ. And St. Paul expresses this where he talks about this in such a way that if the falling away of the gen of the Jews was such joy to the Gentiles, because when the Jews fell away, then the Gentiles were invited into the church. Then the restoration of Israel will be like the rising from the dead. That when they get this event coming right before the end. <clears throat> we should say a word about Antichrist. He's not simply a cruel dictator who is anti-Christian. I think most people, when they think of Antichrist, they think of someone who is simply a, like Hitler, who is a persecutor, and a, or Stalin, he persecutes Christians, he's against religion. And that's not what Antichrist is. Antichrist, he has that aspect. But anti means rather not just against, it means in place of. It will be someone who will come and take the place of Christ. That is because it says quite clearly, he will be in the temple of Jerusalem, worshipped as God. And you don't go and worship some kind of a ordinary dictator, at least. The whole world could not very easily do that. He will come as a world dictator who is accepted as God, as someone very positive. And therefore, he will try to, in every possible way, imitate Christ and take the place of Christ. And therefore, the apostles also emphasize very strongly in their warnings about the end of the world that we must be, we must be aware against deception. St. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, the coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be with all power and signs and lying wonders. God shall send, that is, allow a strong delusion that men should believe a lie. That is, there will be something very deceiving. In fact, you know that the, the elect themselves might be deceived if the times were not cut short. Christ himself warns, and speaking of the last days, that false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray if possible, even the elect. Matthew 24. And in the Apocalypse, in John, states that the last times will be characterized by demonic spirits working wonders. 
And therefore, one of the signs of the coming of the end is the multiplication of demonic signs and wonders, that is, false miracles and things of that sort. Yes? Um, is that like at the, this river in France where these people go to be healed? And um, these signs of these, like, um, Fatima, I mean, these, what the children saw, the Virgin Mary, is that... Well, like, there are signs and signs. There's some, sometimes... Well, I mentioned what I have in mind, particularly later on. <clears throat> Some of these things I mean particularly are the increase in the last uh, several decades of outright Satanism, Satan worship, which only in this last 20 years or so has achieved such openness and notoriety. People who openly call themselves witches. <clears throat> the greatly increased interest in Eastern religions which in these last two or three decades has become tremendously uh, fashionable, so that there are now Western, born American, English, and so forth, gurus and uh, Zen masters and so forth. And people take it quite seriously, and it becomes quite an American institution, all these Eastern things. And people bow down to the ground to form um, Maharaji, and people have proclaimed themselves to be God, quite unheard of in the last two or three decades. <coughs> And this is uh, ordinary idealistic Americans. Some just ordinary people. They're quite capable of going and bowing down to the ground before Maharaji. <coughs> in, in Western Christianity, because the element of the true worship of God, which Orthodox preserved, has been deprived, there's come a reaction, which takes the form of the... Uh, searching after signs. It's a very strong and charismatic movement. And there are quite a few uh, quite spectacular things happen. People speak in tongues. They give uh, so-called prophecies. There are some kind of killings. And um, quite remarkable things occur. And these are not in accordance with what we know of real spiritual life. And it's a, a whole false outlook on spiritual life which causes people to seek these things and to attain them. <clears throat> and of course, they're all the seeking of peace and uh, things like uh, transcendental meditation. There is some kind of a disworldly feeling of contentment which has nothing to do with true spiritual striving. And we could name all kinds of occult and paranormal, paranormal phenomena, which are so prevalent in our times. Various kinds of ESP, which is very uh, research into uh, extra sensory perception, is very strong in Soviet Union, and much more prevalent in America. Where the people who claim to be atheists allow research, in fact, they promote research into things like mental telepathy, hypnotism, faith healing, prophecies, auras of plants, and Humans, clearly in photographs to take of something which is on the boundary between matter and psyche, the action of mind over matter, and so forth. <clears throat> and all kinds of weird things come up in the midst of these experiments. For example, the recent experiments in uh, tape recording the voices of the dead, so called. It's actually a refinement on the seances of the 19th century. The tape recorders are played. When no one is present in the room, and then play the back, and a voice appears on the tape recorder. But not just somebody's imagination. <coughs> uh, there's the uh, uh, famous Stuart Gilly really Jeller. <laughs> Don't play it back. <laughs> so what happens when you play one voice, you get two voices back. <laughs> if that happens, we better start repenting. <laughs> <laughs> One contemporary psychic, Yuri Jeller, you may have heard about, was able to uh, bend spoons by looking intensely at them, and he claims he gets his power from beings in outer space. <clears throat> Some people, of course, they hear about this and they just laugh. I think it's very funny that people are so stupid as to think things like that. But the phenomena which are occurring are quite real, and the explanations which people use to explain them 
question of Rome's faith being God, but also. It's very interesting that demons come back into modern history through this means. <clears throat> All these are signs of uh, occult, uh, strange uh, spiritual attitudes which produce what nowadays can't be called anything else but miracles. It is something that is not a Court, but the normal way of natural process. And this is just what is needed for so that Antichrist will come with great deception, to the demonic wonders and miracles in order to deceive people. Many followers of the charismatic movement, where of course they do not believe in occultism, are very much against it. Unless they accept this very strange phenomena as being in a Christian context. Many people like this believe uh, what they are seeing is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's even a name for it. It's called the, the coming of the third age of the Holy Spirit, or the new age of the Holy Spirit. And they think this is a sign that Christ is coming soon. But the actual prophecies of the Scriptures, as well as Holy Fathers and the early Church, indicate exactly the opposite. Christ himself said in the Luke 8, 18, When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? That is, the true flock of Christ at the end will be very small. And most Christians, most people who call themselves Christians, will follow Antichrist. This idea of the new age of the Holy Spirit is, again, a chiliastic idea. It's looking forward to some kind of a, a this-worldly adaptation of paradise. And it's been in troubling the Western world since the 12th century and appeared for the first time in a follower of Francis of Assisi. All these are very negative signs, and of course the Christian is supposed to be prepared for the most negative things possible. Nonetheless, they're also, we should be prepared and look out for the positive signs at the end of the world. <clears throat> first of all, one of the positive signs is Israel. That is, of course, the state of Israel is a totally neutral thing. But the very fact that it looks as though there's beginning in the Jewish people is some kind of stirring, as though the, 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 the process of coming back to Christ may be beginning. That is a very hopeful, very positive thing. Because that's, um, that's the thing which St. Paul said he would rather sort of be in hell for the sake of his people, if only they would wake up and see Christ who came for them first of all. And when they finally come, that means that's the end of the world. Because all the peoples have been called in, and they are the last ones, the faithful them, to come back. Then there is the movement of conversion to Orthodox Christianity, which we see in many parts of the world, in Africa, since the last, just in the last 50 years. It's been a tremendous a movement of conversion. Of people in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and other countries, now the Congo and other countries, are ordinary people. In fact, they often write to us, as the Orthodox word, the simplest kind of letters, very evangelical, about rejoicing in the Lord, and have scriptural texts, and they're very, very pious and uh, very faithful to Orthodoxy, and just the kind of simple hearted people that Christ wants. This is what uh, the people are coming, people are coming into the Orthodox Church now. The same thing is happening in other countries. In fact, right here in America, we see more and more people are waking up, and for no, often no apparent reason, they're finding out that Orthodoxy is the real church. This is happening also in Western Europe and other countries. <clears throat> then there is suffering Russia. And this is a subject that deserves many talks by itself. But it's certainly a remarkable thing that this country, which for over 60 years now has suffered under communism, under atheism, has endured, and according to all the communist laws, since religion is only a superstitious remnant of the past, when all the old ladies are dead, there will be no more religion left. And now after 60 years and all the old ladies are dead, religion is coming back stronger than ever. Therefore, something is wrong with their idea, and something is wrong is that they do not realize that the soul wants God, wants Christ. And therefore, the, this people for 60 years endured this yoke of atheism, which is a very powerful thing. It's, the whole of society is based upon godlessness. 
And now people are coming, they've endured this and stuck it out and are coming back to believe in God. <coughs> so Janison says about Russia and other countries who endured communism, through intense suffering, our country has now achieved a spiritual development of such intensity that the Western system in its present state of spiritual exhaustion does not look attractive to us. A fact which cannot be disputed is the weakening of human beings in the West, while in the East they are becoming firmer and stronger. Six decades for our people and three decades for the people of Eastern Europe. During that time, we have been through a spiritual training far in advance of the Western experience. Father Dmitry Dutko especially says very similar things. And he makes a very important point also that if someone once <coughs> told him how much better it was to be in the West because there they have freedom and they're able to practice the Christianity and freedom. And he said, but there they have spirituality with comfort. And here we have spirituality with suffering. And therefore it's deeper. And on the basis of our sufferings and the martyrdom, there can come a seed of Christianity. <coughs> blood of the martyrs is a seed of Christianity. And that's why it's something very deep is happening in the Russian people and those who have suffered into communism. And besides this hopefulness coming from Russia, which is waking up to its Christian roots, we also have a very practical thing. That is, Russia in his last 60 years has gone through the experience of living in catacombs and the persecutions and the torture chambers, all the refined techniques of the modern world. <coughs> And the people have survived. And we have records of how they survived. And we know how they were tortured and how they were, how they got through it. And therefore, if this comes here, we already have a beginning. We have a, a something to rely on. We already have more hope that we can endure the same thing that they endured. And finally, the whole outlook of Orthodox Christianity is a positive one. Even in the earliest times, when the whole Roman world was against the church, and since they hunted out Christians from the catacombs and put them to torture and death, the Christians went to their death singing. And therefore, since the essence of our faith is we are preparing ourselves for the world which is to come, our outlook is basically positive. And all the negative things, all the evil which the devil can devise against us, and which men's evil will can torture us with, these are small things compared with the joy which is to come in the kingdom of heaven. And, of course, today we have, more than ever before, the experience of all the past centuries of Orthodox saints and Holy Fathers, martyrs, ascetics, all those who have lived for Christ in this world, in all the different lands, in the West, the East, the North, and South. So this experience is ours to know. Much of it is in English. And it gives answers to basically all of the contemporary questions which come up. And if we have this living contact with the saints of all ages and with the, those who are suffering today for Christ, which is those in the Soviet Union, especially with people like uh, Dmitry Dutko, or with the many people who are in prison camps, and we have some, yes, if you look, if everyone can take a Orthodox America, they'll have, each issue has articles on these people who are suffering in prison camps. And it's very encouraging to see how they do not give up in the midst of all kinds of tortures, and sometimes they, they sort of give in a little bit, and as you can understand, it's a very uh, difficult thing, and they're really extremely courageous. And that gives courage and inspiration to us, that we also can be in the conditions we have now, of freedom, there's no excuse for us not to be offering a struggle to God. Well, that's the basic talk. From that, perhaps if you have any questions, we can discuss further things. Uh, there's a certain uh, type, there's, I was reading today a passage in uh, J.D. Salinger's book, and he, he was talking about the way of the pilgrim in the book, and he's talking about, as, as a common feeling, that you try to link together uh, certain aspects of orthodox spirituality or life with perhaps the Eastern meditations, or uh, try to relate <coughs> all religions and say that they have certain common features, um, and the particular one was that they, they related the Jesus prayer to the, uh, the, the sayings of, that, the, that the Buddhists have and things like that. Uh, how do you respond to that when, when that feeling comes about? I, uh, it seems that, that 
they, it doesn't, I mean, I know that they're different, but I... Well, way. yes, there, there are some things which are naturally religious. The human being is naturally religious, and that's why all these religions of mankind are so natural. And why they're so <coughs> widespread, because man wants to worship something higher, and there are certain ways which help him to do it. And therefore, this is no surprising thing that some things which we have orthodox, which are natural to the human being, will be found in other religions also. Like prayer deeds, recounting prayers, or the fact of saying a Jesus prayer, or a Buddha prayer, or something like that, that sort of belongs to the natural side. But, or making frustrations, or venerating images, this is all akin. But there's a second question, is where does this get you? And are you worshipping the true God, or the false God? Because it's quite clear from the uh, the Christian scriptures, from going back to the Hebrew scriptures, that is the original revealed religion, that the Hebrews were constantly tempted by this, and the side which gets for us heaven is whether you have the true religion, whether you're actually worshipping God the way he wants to be worshipping in, in, in truth. And that's where orthodoxy has to differ from all the other religions. And where, if there comes a final question, it's good to bow down, you can even say it's good to bow down to an idol in a sense. Of course, it's against uh, an orthodox person because that's a serious sin. But a person doesn't know any better. It's better for a person to be bound down to an idol than to be bound down to Marx, or to be bound down to money, something like that. At least he's exercising some kind of thing, a natural religious thing. And later on, that person might wake up and find out about Christ and be converted to the true religion. But that bound down to the idol is not going to save his soul. And orthodox Christianity, that religion which God gave to take all the natural religious instincts we might have and direct them to the right goal, which is God. When the Jews... Uh, are the Jews going to destroy the uh, mosque of Omar and set up... try setting up another temple? Well, that's their problem if they're going to do it. <laughs> um, but is, um, it's one thing, the human in, in, intentions, and the second thing is how God wants it to come out. Because they tried before to build the temple yeah. in Jerusalem. Are they going to revert to, are they going to use like the book of Leviticus and go back to all the laws and all I would, Well, I don't know. I would think they would try to do as much as possible. If the whole idea of building the temple is to get back to that old religion, I suppose they would try to imitate it as closely as they could. But of course, in modern times, they would undoubtedly find they have to change all kinds of things. And when Antichrist himself comes to it, he'll sit there, he'll have his own ideas to, to make it acceptable for everybody else. The exact form is difficult to think how it might come out. But when it's all fulfilled, you see that's exactly that's, that's the way it was predicted. But if, it's, if men try to do something before the time when God wants it to be done, it simply doesn't work. Because in the, that was the attempt of Julian the Apostate. He wanted to build the temple to prove that Christ was wrong. He said that the one stone would not be left from another. And he commanded the Jews to begin building their temple. And they begin building, and it's a very well-authenticated historical fact in several of the early church historians, that they would build, and the night everything would fall down, and they would have seen balls of fire coming out of the earth. Nowadays, historians, they must, must have been digging oil wells or something. <laughs> obviously, there was something there preventing this project from going on. They finally gave up, and then Julian himself was killed, and the whole thing came to nothing. But it was not, the, the, the times were not right for that to happen. It couldn't happen. Of course, today's time is much more right for that. The two who didn't die in the Old Testament, and it was trans translated, it was not found, and Elijah went up in the fiery chariot. And therefore, they will come back as the two witnesses, and preach against him. No, there's a, there could be others like that too. In fact, there are traditions about, some say about John the theologian. There's also a uh, prophecy of St. Sarah that he would come back at that time. But he died already, so he'd come back resurrected. What are they planning but to do? The two mentioned the apocalypse of uh, Enoch and, and Elijah. Are they just going to try and tell the people that this is the Antichrist, this isn't Christ, or are they just going to... Well, the, the, according to tradition, they have two functions. Elijah will speak to the Jews to restore the, it says in the Gospel, and when they asked uh, Jesus, has the John the Baptist, has the Elijah come yet? Some said that John was, John the Baptist was Elijah, because he's supposed to come to reconcile the fathers to the children. And he said that he had come in a certain sense, that is, in the spiritual sense, he had to come. But most people would not accept it, therefore the real Elijah comes at the end of time, to reconcile <coughs> the fathers, the Jews to the sons, the ones who the Gentiles. And Enoch will speak to the rest of the people. In other words, it'll be quite clear at that time who the Antichrist has come, and here are the two prophets speaking and telling them that this is Antichrist.
about something about some of the miracles you were saying, you know, that are that are happening right now. Just just recently, I saw a, you know that's incredible that I showed they have out they had a a Catholic priest who does this healing service and he takes some holy water, supposedly holy water, you know, one of these things that squirts it out. And the goal among his his parishioners will fling out the holy water and it'll hit some people and they'll fall down like they're paralyzed. And he, and he does miraculous healings and all this stuff. But, but, you know, they showed a little bit of his service. And his service looked just like a comedy routine. You know, he was up there laughing, giggling, and telling jokes. That, that was his service. It was absurd. <laughs> Well, that's what happens when you fit in miracles with our modern modern way of life. And that's why, fortunately, orthodox is very difficult to fit into that pattern. Because we're so old-fashioned and different. That it's very difficult to put that, get it so up-to-date that people follow it like a fashion. That preserves us in many ways. If, if uh, Antichrist and the mystery of iniquity will produce imitations of, of uh, Christ's revelation, then surely Antichrist will have uh, his church only it will not it will not in any way be like the Church of Christ. How do you see uh, the uh, world council of churches, the council of the churches of this world as as part of this mystery of iniquity? Well, it's trying to prepare for that. Yes, it's, it's, it's sort of the equivalent, religious equivalent of the United Nations, trying to build up a religious unity which is not on the basis of Christ. Well, the kind of vagueness that you spoke of uh, in that UN obelisk, I have been there. I have been there before, 19, about 1976. And it's actually kind of dark black rock-like kind of thing. It's, very, it's a very vague, ambiguous thing. And it kind of reminds me to some extent of the uh, uh, least common denominator yeah. deity that ecumenism is producing. You know, we all believe in Christ, uh, in whom we have no common opinion whatsoever. Right. And even beyond Christ, because now they welcome non non Christian groups. They just have a dialogue with non Christian religions. So that any kind of religious belief is, is good. Of course, in a certain sense, it's true, but you can't make a, a po anything positive out of that. And therefore, when Antichrist does to that, Antichrist will come to offer a, some kind of a, like a, what you call it, a catalyst, which will all of a sudden gel all the elements together and they'll all bow down to him because he supplies what they want. Yes, the Russian writer Solovyov at the end of the last century. A very interesting man, although he's a little bit crazy in some ways. But he had, in his last few years, he became uh, very changed. In fact, he said that he felt very strange going to church because he felt that the age of the catacombs was about to come back. And he felt they should be going underground to go to church. But he, and this, under the impulse of this last year or two of his life, he wrote a book called Three Conversations on Antichrist and the End of the World which he sets forth like a novel, The uh, Coming of Antichrist. He places it, I think, in the 21st century world wars, and there's a, a great man, leader arises, who first becomes president of Europe, and he's a, by acclamation he's made the president of the world for life, and then world emperor, and he reunites everyone under the basis of like a Roman Empire, and then decides that he has to have a religious unity also, so he calls a world ecumenical council in Jerusalem. And there he offers to all people all that they ever desire, if only they sort of acknowledge him, bow down to him. And the, and the Protestants have a special academy open to, to explore the scriptures from all different points of view, all different kinds of biblical criticism. The Catholics have like a papal institute or something rather. And the Orthodox are offered in Constantinople, and the Hagia Sophia is restored, there's going to be a museum of all possible Orthodox antiquities where every kind of beautiful thing which Orthodox ever had is going to be presented in a museum. And it's supposed to satisfy the Orthodox people. And therefore, everyone will be satisfied with him and they will bow down and worship him. Of course, that means that you'll be satisfied with this external thing, which you think, sort of an external point of view, represents your religion. Anyone who is attracted by, by glittering censers and incense and beautiful vestments, first of all, of course, he'll fall down before Antichrist. How okay. do you see the Orthodox presence in in America, which has more or less produced the uh, World Council of Churches, it is in a way, as we see it today? How how are we to take these apocalyptic apocalyptic terms in that way? What is the apocalyptic significance of Orthodox in America, or what? Yes. Well, I don't think there's anything more significant about America than perhaps any other country, like Uganda. 
But I think it's uh, definitely significant that people are waking up to it. People who've never had no relationship by blood to orthodoxy, simply because they heard the word preached, begin to wake up to see, and especially in a country which is totally Christianized, supposedly, and they wake up and see that all that is called Christianity is not really Christianity, and they want orthodoxy. That uh, could very well be one of the signs of the end, yes. In fact, I think that, of course, there are different kinds of ends when a country uh, comes to its end. It's like when, before communism came to Russia, there was a great spiritual revival actually going on. I had great saints, St. John of Cornish, many, elders of Alton, and many holy monks and bishops living at that time. And many people were very fervent, but this whole society was sort of against it. It became so westernized, so sort of anti Christian almost, that that was finally submerged. But if you look at it from the point of view of a spiritual revival, there definitely was a spiritual revival going on. And therefore, the more you see that kind of thing happening here, you begin to wonder whether it's not coming to the end of something for us, too. And, of course, that's where we're bound up at the end of everything. Because things right now are, seem to be stepping up their tempo. Both things <coughs> in Russia, things in America, the whole world situation, that it looks as though we're heading for some momentous events quite close in the future. And of course, we shouldn't get carried away by historical events. Basically, Christianity is to save your soul. And therefore, each person finds out about the truth and starts right here and now starting to live a life according to the Church's commandments. And that's the first thing we should always have in mind. And if somebody next to you also finds out about it, somebody on the street, and then there's a whole group of people, that's all that better helps you out to struggle the more yourself. But I think you're right also that uh, it's not that much different as, as far as the end result that Gulag and whatever happened in Russia, the aim was to destroy Christianity and it ex to the largest and it, it succeeded. Because uh, it's with great difficulty that people find out about Christianity now. And in the West, all this indifference, tolerance, and freedom, prosperity, all that also helps to destroy uh, any kind of strong Christianity. And the end result, what Solzhenitsyn says, is in the East they become stronger. After communism, they become stronger than we in the West who had all this freedom. But we shouldn't be satisfied being weaker. We should offer to God our struggle. Um, are there any other references made to uh, like the government using a stamp on the hand or on the forehead to be able to purchase food or the things that, that, that you need? Or, or do you think that would go along with the coming of the one world government? It's been done. In uh, 1812, when Napoleon invaded Russia, and they came back and there was no food, or it was stamped on the, either the wrist or the top of the wrist, with a number. Without the number, they couldn't get any food. And Hitler also did something like that. I think it wasn't a number, I think it was some kind of a, a sign, in which, unless you had that at a certain time or place, and he was really. So that, that idea has already been practiced. Yeah, it's, it's a natural. It's a natural thing. How else, if you haven't got papers that's short or you have not a great identification, you yeah. either have to mark a person on the forehead or the hand or something like that. Is there like yeah. a reference made to that in Revelations about that would happen in the end of time? Yes, yes. That's the that's the number of the beast. That is the number six six six, which you're not supposed to inquire into very much. Mm -hmm. It is at least a few speculations. Although six is the number of Earth, you can say, completed the six days of creation. Of, whole number of earthly values must to 666, you might say. But undoubtedly refers to a certain person. When the time comes, we'll see what it means. But that number is supposed to be, the number of the beast is supposed to be given on the right hand and the forehead. Yes, there's three beasts mentioned in the apocalypse. There's this, the, one is the devil, one is, this, is the human being, who is Antichrist, and one is the false prophet, all the people preparing people's uh, <coughs> preparing them to worship the beast. So it's sort of a natural thing that there should be someone to help them out, to make sure they know who the beast is. That's, that's Christ coming again, brought out to him. Yeah. And undoubtedly, he'll be 33 years old, or 30 years old when he comes to reign and everything else. Father, could you please address the uh, topic of the rapture? Yes, well, it's a very basic, it's a simple mistake. The rapture is mentioned by St. Paul. Is it in my book? Has mentioned it. The 
<coughs> Second Thessalonians is it It's uh, the word, <coughs> some common, uh, some recent uh, apocalyptic writers of uh, evangelical sects translate the word apostosia in Greek into rapture in English because it means a, a departure from. So this is where a lot of this... Uh, well, there is a place where the believers will be caught up in the clouds. Oh, okay. And they take that as being the rapture. Well, it's true. The believers will be caught up in the clouds at the end of the world when Christ comes. But that isn't... But they develop... It's like the idea of the millennium. They take that and then develop it into a whole separate teaching, which is in conflict with the rest of the scripture. But that simply means when Christ comes in the clouds with the sign of the, sign of the cross... And the world begins to end, as St. Peter says, the world begins to open flames, and those who are still alive will begin to be caught up in the clouds. The dead will rise from the tombs, and that's the rapture. But the Protestants say they're going to stand there, sit there in the clouds, and watch all the suffering going on the earth for an <laughs> indefinite amount of time. There's no, nothing they can base it on. <clears throat> and it only appeared in their writings, 1840, I think. So the false idea is that, that you'll be spared from all the... Tribulation, yes, in fact, that's an anti-scriptural idea, because it says if the temptation is so great, even the elect, yeah. if the times are not cut short, even the elect would be lost, deceived, and the elect must be right there, suffering with the rest. Yeah. But in Daniel, it's very interesting, in, because in Daniel, there are two aspects. One is the prophecy about the end of the world, and the second is the, is the prophecy about the coming of the, the tyrant, Antiochus, Ep Epiphanes, who actually did that. He went to the temple, had himself proclaimed God, and then bowed down to him in the year. So we have already an image of what of an historical event which already prefigures this. Could you um, tie in a few of the ideas of uh, uh, monastic life with the apocalyptic commitment or the apocalypse? Well, on the most simple level, a monk is one who's supposed to be expecting death, expecting the end. That's where he takes seriously all the words about God. The old life come quickly try to prepare themselves and be in such a state that when Christ comes, you're ready. In that sense, monasticism is apocalyptic. And I think more and more general could be about. <clears throat> but of course, everybody's supposed to be like that if you're a Christian. You shouldn't sort of think that only the monks are responsible for living Christian life. It's not true. The monks are just like anybody else. Once a person wakes up, you look at the early church, there's no distinction who was so monk or lame or what. They all recognized the truth of the gospel, and they saw that it's quite urgent. You better start living it. Could this uh, orthodox jurisdictional separation in this country or be, a, uh, in a sense, a form of chastisement for the West? And Or is there another way to look at it? Is it a, is it a sign of evil or... Could it be, in the end, in used to better ourselves? How, how is one to start to look at that jurisdictional situation? Oh, there's several points of view. I think one you can say it's a large part of it is owing to human weaknesses. Another part, I think, is owing to the fact that this movement of apostasy is so strong in the world that it's very easy for people in position of authority in the church to go along. In fact, the higher you get and the bigger your organization, the easier it is to go along with the times. And therefore, if the jurisdictions aren't getting along quite so well, perhaps one or two of them might be able to stay behind the rest. I think that's what's happening now between our uh, Russian church abroad and uh, most of the jurisdictions that we are sort of left behind. There are lots of reasons why we're separate. Not entirely separate, but sort of cool on the official level. And this, in a way, preserves us. And the fact that we're preserved now enables people outside to look back and see, aha, there is still some kind of a standard of orthodoxy, and what some of our leaders are doing isn't sort of the proper way, and they, they, it helps out. What the end result of it from that, I don't know, but I think it makes more people aware that there's not just one big Orthodox Church, which is following the Catholic Church, which is following the Protestants, which is following the, the Jews, which is following the Unitarians, and the vicious circle. <coughs> so I think I think we shouldn't be terribly upset about things like that. It's, for one thing, it's human nature, but it's um, 
as long as it is not hardened into some kind of a uh, thing which has people calling each other heretics and things like that. I think it could even, in this sense, be a kind of a positive thing. And in the end, when cr- critical times come, then I think it will be seen how useful it was that there were some groups that stayed behind. Some bishops, some priests have already stayed in a sort of backwards point of view in order to be of help when the crisis comes. Because it's true that many of the Orthodox hierarchs are going far too after sort of following, following Rome, just following the Western Confession, pretty much. It's going to come to a disaster before very long. Could you address uh, aspects of science fiction that you had a chance to uh, write about in your orthodoxy and the religion of the future? I noticed you didn't didn't include a great deal of that in your in your lecture. Well, yes, anything particular? Well, um, Bishop Brian Chaninov writes that man expects modern man expects an encounter of one sort or another, and of course we get that in the titles of these movies, you know close encounters of the third kind, and you describe them in your book as barely disguised demons. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know, I, I was wondering if you could include or do a little uh, tying in of this aspect of the mentality of modern, supposedly atheistic man as a sign of the times. Well, yes, I think this. Things like science fiction is only one aspect of it. I think it's the, it's the way through which men, totally sort of atheistic, unbelieving men, can come back to religion, which is not religion that saves your soul, because that requires your soul to repent, but to some kind of vague religious interest, which is perfectly in harmony with the spirit of the times, with worldliness, and therefore that belongs to Antichrist. Because it's remarkable if you look at uh, many of the uh, like the sort of Star Trek series, the things that are performed by these uh, space creatures are just demonic tricks. Just uh, you know, read many lives of saints, and it's interesting that if they who read them from the lives of saints, they would laugh at you. But you read them in a science fiction story, and they, they take, of course they might not say it's take it entirely seriously as reality. Nonetheless, that's the way it begins. First, you sort of accept it as a fantasy, and then. If not you, then the next generation begins to take it more seriously as a reality. It does finally enters into the atmosphere as something quite plausible. I recall one statement made by uh, an engineer when the uh, space shuttle landed. He said, uh, we're, we're just on the brink of, of Star Wars. We really are. <laughs> well, of course, there's a lot of fantasy statements like that. Because uh, they haven't found a single person out there yet to fight them. Mm-hmm. And uh, all these people who write about them, the last several years have been a whole rash of books about uh, UFO sightings and uh, trying to explain them. And they, in fact, one here at Stanford University, and his name is the Frenchman, Jacques Vallée, and uh, uh, Alan Hynek, who are experts in these this phenomena and the sort of the religious side of them. And they come to the conclusion that there's, there's nobody out there at all. It's all some kind of staged performances by somebody in a fourth dimension right here on Earth. And so you read that from an Orthodox perspective, and you say, who is in the fourth dimension right here on Earth? And I say, well, that's demons. That's exactly what demons are. Uh, this was, I think this is a book, well, there are several books now. The one was called... Um, <coughs> It was Alan Hynek, he's an astronomer at Northwestern University, and Jacques Vallée. The Edge of Reality, the one that I've recently. It's very interesting how scientists can get involved with religious things by, first of all, simply approaching some kind of fantasy from a scientific point of view, and getting it accepted seriously from a scientific point of view, and then it sort of enters into people's consciousness. It's harmless. Now when we see around us such an outpouring of... Uh, ideas and attitudes which are uh, not Christian and even anti-Christian, um, and some of the things which we may not even be sort of consciously aware of, but are in the air, what are some practical things that Orthodox Christians can do to um, resist these and become more um, aware of them? Well, I think we should be reading more Orthodox literature. 
write both the lives of saints and writings of fathers on the more practical side especially of Christian life so that we'll have an idea of what are the basic kinds of temptations that come to people who are struggling in the Christian life. And that will help us even in this new kind of situation that helps us to maybe fit it into the type to which it belongs. And the more you're doing that, the more you're prepared. I mean, there's not even anything else to face the temptations that are happening now. And another thing is to try to sort of look at the things that go on in the world around you with a critical point of view. It is not simply accepting whatever is in fashion, whatever happens to be. In fact, if it comes into fashion, since the times are always evil and now more than ever, is bound to be some kind of a wrong reason for it to be in fashion. Therefore, you should instantly distrust some kind of new fashionable thing and don't give your whole trust to it. So to look, it doesn't mean you have to be entirely sour about everything. It means you have to be just cautious. The St. Paul says you have to be walking circumspectly, redeeming the day, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. <coughs> and that was true in his time, it's all more so now. The evil is built up so much. And then especially things which I think in our times one of the most important things is to be aware of since we live in um, civilization which is very advanced in the sense of providing instant comfort and all kinds of convenient things there's a certain kind of like paralysis which can come over one or a certain kind of uh, almost hypnotism and you have to be aware of anything which makes you extra passive for example television watch television too much it produces this kind of feeling of very passive waiting for the next thing that's going to come to you and it's a very da- spiritually a very dangerous state therefore I think that kind of a thing especially we should watch out not to, to be aware of anything that looks is going to produce, produce some kind of a passive state in us which can be or can lead directly to some kind of hypnosis or hypnotic suggestions I think if you're doing those things plus leading a normal Christian life and making sort of um, saying prayers according to the prayer book and attending church when you can making and uh, venerating icons making frustrations and the normal things that Orthodox Christians do all these help guard against all the evils that are in there also um, you've been involved before you became Orthodox with Hinduism is that, is that right? With not much Hinduism more than Buddhism Buddhism well how do you regard uh, East masters of these religions who claim to have achieved some union with an impersonal being. Yeah. You regard that as, how do you regard that as being, um, regarded as being deceived by demons, or do you regard it as... Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I just, just made I mean, what, what is the re- what's the origin of this impersonalist concept? Well, the origin of that concept, I think, it comes from people who don't want to meet the personal God. They, they fear the personal God. Because he definitely requires things of you. And so there's but I think in many cases, people who say they have this experience, some kind of an illusion, some kind of a wishful thinking, which, they, which is very much helped by this feeling of Zen meditation. Which you quiet yourself down, quiet yourself down, quiet yourself down. And if you haven't got anything really deep inside of you that wants to come out, you can get yourself into a quiet state you think you met God or whatever you're you looking for. So they're satisfied with the insufficient spiritual state? No, I, I say it's like spiritual maturity, spiritual sort of half grown up or something like that. But I think if there's anything passion inside of you, that's finally a little crazy and break the bond. So it's not a direct pulling away from God, it's just like stopping at the threshold, or not at the threshold, but at a... Well, of course, they, then their ideas and all of them are just instantly against the whole idea of Christian God. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how a person comes back from that to find the true God if he's going to have a very difficult time or what. But the, the way they describe, for example, the meditation at this uh, Shasta Abbey, I can see that for a person who wants to avoid problems and not be <coughs> confused, he can sort of finally talk himself into the state of being absolutely quiet and think he's happy. And the way that these religions have been interpreted in the United States uh, is is, uh, is partially uh, partially um, has been affected by the idea of self perfection that we can do it on our own and like as it, as it oh, individuals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, everything oriental that comes to America is just given American coloration. That our own problems enter into it and the answer that's given is 
to affect whatever is needed by miracles. Could you comment on um, <laughs> your, one of your first citations of Roman Catholicism's uh, kind of spirituality was Francis of Assisi? Yeah. Well, he seems to be the beginning of what happened in the West. He's already, he's already 100 years after the schism, or more than 100 years. And there's several elements in his life which just don't ring true from the Orthodox point of view. Uh, let me think of, well, the, the time he made the great uh, fuss about he was sick and he ate meat. And when he got well, he made a big point of going through the streets and telling them, you all think I'm a holy man, look at me, I ate meat. And someone was running after him, whipping him, pouring ashes on his head and making a big demonstration. And that's not very, that's not sober. As you're showing off that you're evil, which means that you're proud. Some kind of pride is involved. Or especially when he got the stigmata, he's the first one to receive the stigmata. And he received those by asking Christ to let him suffer just like he did. And that's simply an orthodox person could not ask a thing like that. I mean, if you have, you're wholly 100% in that, in the spirit of orthodox worship, you don't ask to suffer like Christ because he did it once. And you don't, that's not your doing. It would never occur to you. But he wanted to be like Christ. And therefore, he got some kind of a thing which came in his hands, apparently some kind of psychic phenomenon. And there are some other things. And there are the, some of the writers of his lives even go further. They say, when Francis died, God the Father did not know at which to be more pleased, at Francis, at his first son, Christ, or his second son, Francis. Because that's the, the writer of the life, which maybe beyond Francis himself. But it, I think it's already showing that there's this element of deception entered into him, to his life. And in his, I mean, most of his things he did, maybe they wouldn't be subject to that, but there's enough already that you can see the beginning, and later on it gets more developed in the West. You mentioned Augustine, what are some of his ideas considered heretical by the Orthodox Church? Yeah, he's not, they're not called heretical, but he's, he's known for exaggerations, especially his doctrine of grace. Was exaggerated. That is, he did not formulate it in the Eastern way. He overemphasized so much the grace of God that he sort of didn't have room for man's freedom. And when he was attacked on this, he said, oh, well, of course, I do believe in man's freedom, but nonetheless, he couldn't fit it into his system. And therefore, if you want to understand about grace and free will, you better read John Cassian at the same time and talk the correct teaching. But those that's the other fathers like St. Gregor Nisa also made mistakes. And that's when you, don't, you, you cast aside any ideas which are wrong and you read them. The ideas which are good to keep. And in his case, his repentance is very profound, very, very moving. Um, Father, I think perhaps that we should, we should take a break um, and then go into Vespers. All right. Very good. We'll have them the Vespers after we have a little fresh. We'll have the Vespers for St. Athanasius the Great. The main heresy at the time of St. Athanasius was the heresy of Arius, which is very similar to many modern Protestants teach that Christ is actually not God. He's only a man who somehow, in various ways that he would express, either later on adopted the power of God, or was like God, or any way they express it, he's not God himself, come in the flesh, but a man who has more or less divine power. And therefore, if this is true, that means Christ is like another prophet. Maybe he's better than all the prophets, but still, just another man. And therefore, the whole idea of God coming to earth to take away the sins of man is done away with. Therefore, he rose up against this heresy the other than the other at the time, and was very firm in not getting into it, as a result of which for five times he was chased out of his sea of Alexandria, subjected to all kinds of persecutions, and suffered for confessing the true worth of his faith, which he handed down, therefore, to us in our day. I have to remember him with love and remember that he's alive. These holy fathers are not simply people who lived in ancient times, but people who now are with God and hear our prayers, hear our praises to them. Therefore, they're praising that these services written not just many centuries ago. Let us try to understand the words and offer our praises to him. And of course, through him, we offer our praises to God. Christ is risen from the dead, trampled under fire. And on those in the tombs bestowing life, Christ is risen from.